These horrifying creatures lurk in the underground caverns and old ruins throughout the material world. They are frightening monsters, especially to adventurers who have never ran into them before. They can transform your flawless skin into a transparent membrane that must be constantly kept wet or it'll start drying out and you'll die. Or maybe you get too close and want to hug these strange fish monsters, only get a bit of their mucus in your mouth, and now all you can breathe is water. Abelos are horrifying and they are highly intelligent. They have memories of when they were once viewed as gods by all the races they enslaved. They have memories of when the gods came and crippled their empires, and they aren't forgetting any of it. Their ultimate goal is to reclaim their ancient empires, and in the meantime, they'll settle for just enslaving all the mortals foolish enough to stumble on their cities. Before we truly begin looking at the Ableth, we do just want to put out a warning that there is a lot of slavery involved with Ableths. If you're not into that or want something a little bit happier, we highly recommend checking out our video on the Flumps or the Gripply. The Ableth was first introduced to Dungeons & Dragons and the module Dwellers of the Forbidden City, released in 1981, as a random monster that was meant more to be a trap than as a big part of the adventure. They were later reprinted in the Monster Manual 2, released in 1983, and really took off when an article on the ecology of the Ableth was written by Brandon Christ in Dragon Number 131, released in March of 1988. The Ableth is an amphibious creature that can be found dwelling in underground lakes and caverns with their host of enslaved creatures. In the adventure, Dwellers of the Forbidden City, the Ableth there is guarding the front entrance to a city using illusionary traps to trick adventurers into falling into a moat, and then the Ableth would then enslave any adventurers it could and take them to an underground city. One of the factions inside of the Forbidden City worships the Ableth as a god and offers it slaves, treasure, and magic items. As first impressions go, it's a good start for the Ableth, though the fact it was just a one-off trap monster is a little disappointing. These creatures are incredibly smart, dangerous, and have a whole lot of powerful abilities. If you get too close to them in the water, you can no longer breathe air and must breathe water. If you let them touch you with their 10 foot long tentacles, your skin is going to start changing and you have to constantly be soaked in water or your skin will dry out and you'll take damage every turn you are not in water. Or maybe you decide to start running away from it well, hopefully you get away fast or else it can enslave you with its mental powers. Also, it still has illusions to mess with your mind if everything else fails. Fighting an Aboleth is a lesson on fighting things that don't play fair, but you shouldn't despair if your game master has a huge smile and sets down an Aboleth mini. There are plenty of things that can help you survive against them. First off, they are great swimmers, but they are incredibly slow on land. Secondly, you do get a save to stop your skin from turning to mucus, if your best friend, the Cleric, is able to cast Cure Disease on you within 2-5 to five rounds of you getting changed, you no longer have to worry about your dried out skin. Though a Cure Serious Wounds is required to remove the slimy membrane skin condition. And lastly, if you get its mucus in your mouth, it only lasts between 1-3 to three hours before you can breathe air again. In the meantime, you have to paddle around in the kiddie pool before you can breathe air. Now we've talked about what it can do to you, but what exactly does it look like? It's amphibious, most of them have four tentacles. Its body is covered in slime with a singular tail to help propel it quickly through the water. The most common of the Ableth are 20 feet long from their three eyes on their face to the fish-like tail at the end. They feed off of microscopic organisms in the water as they have no teeth in their mouth, though they can still bite and swallow whole medium-sized creatures like your average adventurer, but it's not something they actively try to do. They are freaky with their three eyes down the front of their face, and their mouth is on the bottom of their head, always facing down. They weigh several tons, with the largest of them weighing up to 10 tons. The adventure that the Ableth is introduced in, and their entry in the Monster Manual 2, provide scant few details about the civilization of the Ableth. In fact, they only mention that there are rumors of a secret city beneath the surface in massive underground lakes and caverns where more of the Ableth and their slaves live. In the ecology of the Ableth, more secrets are revealed, along with several more types of Ableths. The most common of the Ableth are the ones that everyone encounters on the surface, and no one thinks that there are more Ableths than that. Unfortunately for everyone, there are secret cities and they are full of Ableths and their slaves. The ones on the surface are just the weakest sent to bring back more slaves, and to keep gathering information for the other Ableths. Above the common Ableth is the Greater Ableth, who takes the slaves at the common gather and are in charge of large masses of slaves in the city, watching over them, and breeding them for qualities that the Ableths want. After the Greater Ableth is the Noble Ableth, who work as the scientists of the Ableths, developing new technology and harnessing the power of science. Ableths despise magic, and while they can cast some spells innately, they mostly focus on their psionic powers and their technology, 
targeting magic users first when it comes to a fight. What separates the Noble Aboleth from the others is its larger head, and while it has four tentacles, two of them end in three fingers it can use for fine manipulation and motor control. Watching over the city of Abolus are the ruler Abolus. These creatures are in charge of the Abolus cities and rarely ever leave except to mate with other ruler Abolus and other Abolus cities. Yeah, there are more than one Abolus city, which means there are a lot of Abolus below the surface. Try not to think about that too much when you go spelunking in that old abandoned mineshaft. Speaking of mating, Abolus mate, and as horrifying as they appear now, we don't want to imagine that. Each Ablith has a set of male and female organs in them, and when they mate, which is about every 500 years, each participant gets a single egg that it then deposits somewhere safe for it to fertilize in a week. The egg is covered in a thick slime that protects and provides nourishment, and over 5 years it grows from the size of a human head to just over 6 feet long. The Ablith will then hatch, and after a year of mutating, will take on the parents of its parents. 10 years later, and it's an adult and raid to grab some slaves, or rule a city, or anything else that Ablith's do. The final Ablith, since a ruler Ablith apparently wasn't enough, is known as the Grand Ablith. These massive creatures are 70 feet long at the shortest, and can communicate telepathically with any Ablith within 10,000 miles of it, giving it complete knowledge of all of its Ablith. The Grand Ablith watches over multiple Ablith cities and is hidden in the deepest part of the world, watching over the Ablith and formulating its plans. The plans of Abolus is to take over worlds, and the Grand Abolith uses its noble Abolus, the scientist, to figure out ways of reaching other worlds and stealing their resources, and, of course, taking slaves. One final note on the Abolith, a few months after Dragon number 131 was released, Dungeon number 12, released in July and August of 1988, released an ocean adventure where an Abolith was a part of it. This brings up that there is saltwater Abolith, though none of the other sources mention that the common Abolith can only live in freshwater. The only new piece of information provided is that there are rumors that Abolith are from a different, strange dimension, and have come to this dimension for total domination. The Abolith is back in the second edition, appearing first in the Monstrous Compendium Volume 2 before being reprinted in the Monstrous Manual, and it is an addition of sadness for them. A year after we get a look into the fascinating society of Abolus, it is struck down and we are reduced to just a brood of Aboliths. A parent and its children, Abolith, are all that remains of the great society and quite frankly, it makes us want to ignore the entire edition. At the very least, we get more descriptions of the physical appearance, which does a little to mend the sorrow in our heart, even for something as horrifying as this creature. An Abolith resembles a plump fish, its body green and blue with gray splotches and a tan underbelly that conceals its toothless, rubbery mouth. Its three eyes are purple-red and protected by bony ridges that surround them and each eye is set on top of the other. It has four pulsating black orifices along its belly. They ooze gray slime that smells like rancid grease and can be used to cover its treasure hoard. It has four tentacles that sprout near its head that feel like leather and uses them to propel itself forward while on land, its tail used to propel itself while in the water. A brood of Abolus consists of a singular parent with one to three offspring who are the same size as the parent. These offspring obey their parent implicitly and only become independent when their parent dies off. All Abolus pass down their knowledge to their offspring when it is born, and all mature Abolus can learn any knowledge that their intelligent food knew in life. That is, if they eat a wizard, they know all the wizard's knowledge of magic and lore. The Abolus now love of eating intelligent creatures, though they are still after slaves, with the source material only barely suggesting it might be for a hidden city, but no one can prove anything. The only saving grace for the Abolith is the release of the adventure Night Below, an Underdark Campaign from 1995, and Monstrous Compendium Annual 2 from 1995, where the Savant Abolith makes an appearance. The Savant Abolith is a powerful magic user able to cast priest and wizard spells, and that's pretty disappointing. It completely removes the idea that they hate magic, and now the Savant Abolith is one of the greatest magic users in existence, as the best of their kind can be up to 12th level priests and level 14 wizards all in one slimy, gross, fishy body. In the night below an Underdark campaign, heroes must assault an Abolith city, known as the Great Shabatha, and this requires careful planning for a head-on assault just won't cut it. Throughout the city are armies of Kuatoa, Mind Flayers, and even a regiment of devils who are interested in the powers of the Great Savant, a massive Savant Abolith who rules over the city and is attempting to create a more powerful domination magic field to enslave all of the surface dwellers. 
Savant aboliths appear much like the regular aboliths, except they have unusually prominent bone ridges around their eye slits and their tentacles have spots of calcification to make them even more dangerous. Quite frankly, who is seeing so many aboliths that we can use the word unusually when describing something as minor as large bone ridges? It seems like a very dangerous proposition to be hanging out with aboliths all day and measuring their bone ridges. The savant abolith also brings back the idea of the abolith cities beneath the surface, though it drops the type of abolith only to regular and boring abolith and the savant abolith. All others are removed, and it is the savants who are in charge of the city, and the regular abolith has to go out, gather slaves, food, and anything else the savant wants. Now, just because the savant can cast a few spells, you would think that the abolith would eventually get tired of doing everything for these lazy savant abolith. But the savants have something extra going for them. They can create glyphs throughout their domains that empower abolists and completely fuck over any adventurers who get too close to them. The weakest of the glyphs will just explode and deal some damage, while the strongest will make it far harder on the adventurer to escape being mind controlled by the abolists, or will more easily transform into a creature with transparent membranes and only able to breathe water. So we suppose the savant abolists do have some use in their society, and it helps that the savants are sterile. Which brings us to one last fact to leave you before we move on to the next edition. Abolists now lay an egg once every five years on average. No more waiting 500 years for the perfect romantic night to make some baby abolith. Now they are pumping out offspring like clockwork, which, quite frankly, is horrifying. We definitely don't need more of these creatures filling the water with their weird mucus clouds and enslaving all creatures on the surface with the psionic powers. The Abolith returns in 3rd edition and doesn't even have to wait for a second monster manual like in the past, now appears in the first monster manual released in 2000 and reprinted in 2003, and with it comes very little information. Beyond being called revolting, they are also classified as cruel and highly intelligent, making them extremely dangerous predators. Their physical attacks and horrifying effects are still the same, and it is looking like this edition was going very light on the lore, until we get the release of Lords of Madness, The Book of Aberrations, released in 2005. Finally, our quest for more information on the Ablis and several other really cool aberrations like Mind Flayers and Beholders is given to the masses. We are given three new types of Ablis to sink our rubbery mouths onto, and there's a treasure trove of information. The first thing you learn is that their mouth isn't actually rubbery. In fact, their mouth is in the shape of a triangle with thousands of small teeth. These small teeth line its mouth and esophagus so that anything eaten is ripped into ribbons and is basically a slurry of meat and bones by the time it hits the stomach. For a complete look at the entire biology of the Ablith, it's worth a read, but we don't have hundreds of thousands of words to talk about it here, so we're just going to hit the basics. Ablis cannot stay out of the water for very long. For every hour they are out of the water, they begin losing dexterity until they only have a 1 in that score and become stuck, unable to move further. The outer layer of their skin becomes so dried out it turns to tough leather and they are unable to move. This does not kill the Ablith, instead they are in a state of being known as the Long Dreaming. This is a fate many consider be worse than death. In this state, they can last forever, unable to move, waiting for water to reach their skin and unbind them from torment. Aboliths are also reported to live for thousands of years and they might even be immortal. Though the oldest Aboliths are massive creatures and rarely ever venture to the surface, so little is known about them. Another big thing about the Ablis is that they have incredibly long memories and they learn all their knowledge from their parent when they are born. And yes, a singular parent. The reproduction cycle of an Ablith is that the parent every five years is consumed with the urge to produce a child so they find a secure or hidden away cave or cavern and will lay between one to three eggs in a slime-like cement and then squirt enzymes out of their tail that will soak through the slime, hardening it. The enzymes will then fertilize the eggs and an offspring will be born in about five years. The offspring are born completely matured but are much too weak to protect themselves and they stick with their parent for about 10 years until the child leaves on their own. Up until now, the Abolists haven't really had a deity they followed and we are given a reason for that. Abolists, because they have such excellent memories and have all the memories of their parents, all know when their race was created. They credit their creation to Piscathes, the Blood Queen, who is an elder evil who travels through the dimensions, spreading her seed to all the world. The Ablis do not see her as a deity to worship, though they do give thanks and show respect to her and their architecture. Instead, they see their creation as just something that happened, and as she doesn't play an active part in their lives, it isn't something to worship. Another reason why the Ablis don't worship a god or some other deity is that they have been around long before the gods were born or created or found the world. 
When the material world they claim as their own was first created, they were controlling the world with their massive empire and enslaving all useful races to build their cities. Unfortunately for the Abolists, something happened to those races when they learned about faith and the gods came. The gods are said to have destroyed the Abolists almost completely, with some stories claiming that only a single Abolith escaped the wrath of the gods. So this is probably a good enough reason as to why they don't worship gods. They were on this world first, they were almost driven to extinction by the gods, and they have all the memories of this event from their parents that they can see perfectly. It's probably a hard thing to forget. Beyond exploring more of the history and religion of the Abolith, we are also given information on three new Aboliths. The Amphibious Abolith, the Stygian Abolith, and the Ubolith Abolith. The Amphibious Aboliths are stuck in areas with little water and have adapted to it. In places like a swamp, these Aboliths are able to breathe air and water, have some mobility on land, and they are more resilient to succumbing to the long dreaming. The Ubalith Abolith are also known as aerial aboliths, and these creatures can be found miles above the surface inside of massive clouds that they hold together with a psionic power. They rarely, if ever, venture within a mile of the surface and instead stick to their clouds with others of their kind. The final new aboliths are the Stygian aboliths, who eons ago were able to transport their massive abolith city and their slaves to the Nine Hells, more specifically Stygia, a layer of the Nine Hells as a massive frozen saltwater ocean. Here the Abolists prospered and began morphing their shape to become more devilish. They control vast quantities of aquatic devil slaves and mortals from a variety of different aquatic worlds, and they are slowly growing ever more powerful in their frozen oceans. Many believe that the Stygian Abolists are close to evolving into new breeds of devils, though for now they merely display some fiendish qualities. Lastly, our Abolists now have minions, known as scum. These creatures are the blending of human and fish with scales, fins, and other grotesqueries. They are slaves used for protection, carrying treasures, or anything else the Aplith needs. Scum are terrifying creatures to behold and have lost all their humanity and are full-on aberrations serving their dark masters. They are what happens when the Aplith uses their muckus to morph and change their slaves, though they only choose their strongest and most trusted to change in scum. Introduced in the Monster Manual, the 4th edition brings a lot of changes for the Abolith, and most of it definitely doesn't fall under the good category. Our Aboliths are still horrifying to behold, sort of. Their updated picture for the 4th edition shows them with a mouth directly beneath their eyes, which is less freaky than a rubbery mouth or a triangle mouth with rows of sharp teeth. Their tentacles are a lot lower down on their body, and really, they just kind of look sad and dejected, probably since they'll have to enslave people to make friends as no one will willingly be their friend. In fact, the Abolith's way of making friends is a lot different than this edition, and it's a bit more restrictive. There are three types of Abolith. The Lasher, the Sly Mage, and the Overseer, and they all have their own roles. The Lasher is focused on killing everything and has no way of enslaving other creatures. Instead, it lashes out with a tentacle and the target is dazed and covered in slime. It then repeats this process over and over, bludgeoning the creature to death. It's a damn shame there was nothing about the creature's skin turning into a slimy mucus. The Abolith was created to cause these horrifying effects to a party who had never encountered a creature before, and it just removes that. Up next is the Slime Mage, who now has the ability to dominate, except they still aren't enslaved. They can only dominate a singular target. After that, they are launching balls of slime at their opponents. The slime can immobilize or slow a creature, but it has none of the effects of the previous edition. Lastly, the Overseer gets the ability to enslave creatures by blasting a dominated creature's mind until they drop to zero hit points. At that point, the creature is enslaved and ready to be turned into a servitor of the Aboliths. We're gonna circle back to those servitors in just a moment. Let's talk about one more ability that all Aboliths possess. It's their mucus haze that is exuded from all of them. All enemies within 25 feet of the Abolith treat the area as difficult terrain and, well, that's it. No losing the ability to breathe precious air, no gaining the ability to breathe water, nothing. It's just difficult to walk through. And on top of that, it isn't even restricted to being just in water. It's everywhere. Speaking of which, the Abolith now has a walking speed of 25 feet. Sure, that isn't as good as their 50 foot swim speed, but in the past edition, Aboliths were literally crawling on the land with a 10 foot walking speed. They are fast and deadly on land and in water, and that means a major weakness of theirs, dry land, doesn't really help out a group of adventurers. Back to the Servitors, and this might be one of the weirder things to exist for the Abolus. All throughout the past editions, the Abolus wanted slaves to create their cities, and if an Abolus ever ventured more than a mile away, the slave would get a chance to break their enslavement. 
which is a bit annoying as it means an Aboleth has to stick within a mile of all its slaves all at the time, but it's doable. Now, such creatures don't even get a chance to break from their enslavement. Instead, once the Aboleth is more than 50 feet away, the servitors all stop moving and just stand there all sad until their master comes back. That's completely ridiculous. Here I was thinking how restrictive a mile was, and now the Aboleth can't even go into the next room to get a snack without their slaves standing around being useless. Also, they just look like humanoids that have been flayed of their skin and not strange fish man creatures. Speaking of Aboleth cities, there is no mention of them at all in the Monster Manual, though in the Forgotten Realms campaign guide from 2008, there is a chapter on the Aboleth citadel called Ixapu. We aren't going to be talking about that as we avoid campaign-specific lore in these deep dives. The Aboleth in the 4th edition is just described as coming from the Far Realm and making their home in old ruins far down in the Underdark. Beyond that, there is little else described about the Aboleths, and that's a damn shame as they have such a rich lore built up for them in the past editions. The Aboleth arrives in the Monster Manual, released in 2014, and with it comes a mighty stat block to make any adventurer run away in horror. The Aboleths regain several abilities, like transforming creatures so they must always be in the water, they can make creatures that get too close to them only be able to breathe water, and they are back to enslaving any foolish mortal that tries to assume they have free will. The Aboleth is back to its full power, and we are even given some updated lore that mostly makes sense. Aboleths have been around in the primordial oceans long before there were gods and had slaved sentient races until the gods came and destroyed their Aboleth empire. The Aboleths have never forgotten this event as they have perfect memory and have vowed to rise again and destroy the gods. The Aboleths never forget, and the memory of this event is still crystal clear to them as they don't actually die when destroyed. They just reform in the plane of water. Yeah. Sure, that makes perfect sense. We're lying, it doesn't. There is no mention as to why they reform in the plane of water, just that they do. There is no lore or history supporting that, and it's just a bit of new information that feels like a weird throw-in. Beyond their perfect memories in rebirth in the plane of water, they can also devour other creatures and gain their memories. If someone were interested in researching the ancient past, the Abolus would be the perfect creatures to talk to, if it weren't for the whole enslaving of all mortal creatures that the Aboleths practice quite regularly. Aboleths have no specific Aboleth city in the Monster Manual, and they seem to just be solitary creatures with no broods to take care of. The only information about Aboleth cities is that a singular Aboleth will make their lair in the ruins of an ancient Aboleth city, and that's it. There is information in the adventure anthology Ghosts of Salt Marsh, released in 2019, from the adventure The Styes, which is actually an adventure from 3rd edition, but updated to 5th edition. And the adventure, an Aboleth from the Aboleth city of Endless Nadir, has found a kraken and is obsessed with the entity known as Thera's Dune. It is tempting to care for the juvenile kraken until it can reach full maturity, as the Aboleth thinks Thera's Dune wants the Aboleth to do that. The city Endless Nadir has dispatched two Aboleths to go after the Thera's Dune worshipping Aboleth and destroy it, which is a bit of a trick seeing as how they are just reborn in the plane of water. All in all, the Aboleths have a lot of their old abilities back, including using illusions to trick mortals with, Though, part of us still misses the days when they hated all magic and had complicated societies with several other kind researching technology to bring the world to its knees. At least we get rid of the servitors and bring back the scums and ghosts of Saltmarsh with a pretty cool facelift. They look more like squid humanoid monsters rather than flayed humans or cheesy 80s horror fishmen. Our Masters of the Deep have had a lot of changes throughout the editions, though it has all been building up to some horrifying creatures that will completely ruin an unprepared part of the day. These Aboleths have great and powerful societies, and nothing can stop their eventual rise, for their empire shall conquer the mortal world and destroy the gods who are foolish enough to interfere. 